Well, hello everyone. It's Thomas Martin, the Director of Strategic Partnerships with SUAA. Thank you for joining us uh, for this Q&A session with our Executive Director, Brian Sodi. First wanted to go over a few things here. Uh, I'm not going to go through this entire slide, but these are some of the statistics we gathered about uh, the questions we received. If you'd like to read through the slide, you can pause the video and press play and join us again here. Here's another breakdown by the uh, percentage of questions by topic. And a quick disclaimer that although at SUAA we like to say we have a magic wand, uh, we do not have a crystal ball. We are unable to answer hypothetical questions and we do not speak on behalf of SIRS, although we, uh, we do look to be having a Q&A session uh, with SIRS here in the future. And uh, some of the questions uh, were very similar in the topics they discussed, so in some cases we did condense those questions into one question. Uh, as alluded to before, there are questions that we received uh, that are uh, suited for SIRS. Anything to do with your retirement planning, uh, finances, survivor benefit information, uh, that is information you can receive by going to surs.org. And we're about to jump right into it with Brian Sodi, but this is just to give you an outline of the order of the show we plan a few welcomes into introductions, uh, some of the legislative issues, and a few more of the topics that you can see on your screen. So I am going to get off the screen here. Uh, we're going to go over to uh, Executive Director Brian Sodi. And uh, Brian, I'm going to ask you uh, the first question we have here from one of our men members. Uh, how will our pensions be changed? <clears throat> well, thank you, Thomas, and I uh, really appreciate you setting this conversation up for us. And the wonderful response of the members has been great. Um, we didn't know how many questions to expect or, or what to expect, but here we are. Um, and that's a doozy of a first question, so let's dive right in. But uh, I, th I think any time the General Assembly is in session, there is a possibility that your pensions could be changed, impacted um, for the better or for the worse. And obviously, we at the State University's Annuitants Association are working to make them better. Uh, and uh, there are unfortunately other agents out there who might view your benefits that you've earned um, as something different. Um, we are there to make sure they don't have that misunderstanding. Um, in fact, I don't know if you've heard this yet, but more than 100 members of the General Assembly have less than five years, five years or less service. And so we really need your help educating folks on uh, your pension and how important it is. Uh, and we look forward to working with you on that. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to go over to the uh, next question. It's, uh, it's uh, just bear with me here. Uh, the question is, who is speaking to journalists when there are articles about how rich the state pensioners are? Why do they quote averages instead of median annuity figures? This information needs to get out there. The numbers are tremendously skewed by high-level retirees. Most of us are way below average. Thank you for taking my question. That's another great question. We receive that from a lot of folks on a regular basis. Uh, you know, I hate to, to be cliche, but the old story about a lie gets around the world before the truth has a chance to put its pants on is very um, apt uh, here. Um, for SUAA and what we're doing, we're trying to elevate our communications game and get out there with you to talk about the importance. Um, you know, and I know less than 1% of you asked personal questions, but I will share with you that, that my mother and father were both teachers. Um, my, my father was a SERS annuitant uh, until he passed and my mother is a survivor. So we're very, very familiar with these issues um, and how they impact average retirees. Um, we agree with you, and we're going to try and be more proactive in talking about it, and we hope to have your help in that process as well. Um, recently, we did issue a press release supporting the governor's proposed uh, budget and pension uh, plan, and we will continue to be active in those arenas uh, as well, and we'll need your help for that. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, the next question was, what is the status of current bills affecting SERS pensions? Well, that's a great question. Um, currently, a lot of the bills that are pending in the General Assembly are simply being heard as subject matter only. 
Uh, the Illinois House has been very, very proactive um, throughout last fall. And again, uh, in the summer and fall last year, and they're continuing those subject matter hearings this year. Um, tier two issues have focused on police and fire. Um, they're trying to lower those retirement ages for police and fire. And as that impacts us at the state universities and colleges, uh, we're worried about campus security and trying to make sure that they're included. But we have not seen the legislative draft language for that other than in its subject matter only form. So although we've seen a lot of ideas, we haven't seen anything that's to be voted on. We do anticipate the last week of March uh, of 2024 to be when those votes will take place. Um, so for those of you listening, when this comes out, it should be within the next eight to 10 days that we would have some more to report on that. Um, the Illinois Senate, I think it's important to note, they have a special committee on pensions. It has not met yet this spring. And we really don't know where the Senate is on some of these ideas and how they're they may interpret some of these proposals. Um, but you can be assured that SUA will update the membership as those uh, uh, issues develop, and we'll be sure to engage the membership when it's appropriate to let legislators know how we feel about those bills. Well, moving on to any potential threats the state's pensions might be facing, uh, an SUAA member asks, what is the greatest risk to the pensions of retirees? For example, would it be inadequate funding, legislation, a constitutional convention? There are many risks from many different <clears throat> areas. You never know which one's going to jump out at us at a, very, at a, at a, at, at a given time. Um, I think the short answer is that's why we need to join the SUAA, why we need to be participating and active in that, why we need to get our colleagues, our friends um, involved as well. Um, the larger our membership, the larger our voice. And I think the biggest risk that we have is if we're not speaking up for our issues, others will speak for us. And I think that touches on the issue we talked about earlier, that when we leave it to the journalists or to the media, um, they're going to frame this issue and these set of issues the way they want to. And we have to work together to make sure that we collaborate on a consensus message that really helps frame us in the way that we need to be viewed. Getting to the uh, financial stability of the SERS pension system, a uh, member asks, how sound is our pension program in Illinois at this time? She says, uh, I worry about the security of my retirement payment. Will it continue during my retirement years? Uh, that's the million dollar question we all ask, right? Um, there's no simple answer to that. We've already discussed the risks. As it stands today, the State University Retirement Systems Plan is 45% funded, which means 55% unfunded. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, the issue obviously is where the rubber meets the road is the fact that they created Tier 2 to try and address some of these issues. We at SUAA believe that they should increase funding, not decrease benefits. And that goes for health insurance benefits as well. Um, about 50% of the current college and university employees are tier one and about 50% are tier two. So we have an, uh, a, just an unacceptable situation of people working side by side doing the same job and being rewarded differently for it. Um, we think it's time that stop, but we know it's not going to be an easy thing to do. Um, we have to make sure that tier one funds and the funding that is currently there that's supporting tier one activities, uh, active participants. Is, is not impacted by trying to help tier two folks. And let me be clear, we wanna increase tier two, but we want the funding to be there for tier two to be fixed as well. We believe folks who do the same work should get the same benefits. We're now gonna be moving on to questions related to SUAA's future uh, and other organizational questions. Um, now we've got one here, which is, is tier two a real issue for current employees not to join? And what is a positive to motivate them to join SUAA? Well, there's another great question. Uh, we knew we'd get great questions from this membership and tier two um, started in March, 2010. It was passed, it took effect January 1st, 2011. Um, for those of you who started working at colleges and universities after January 1st, 2011, you are considered tier two. Um, please know that at SUAA, we don't have any tiers of membership. We think you're all top tier. 
Um, but there is a very real issue going on right now in the workplace in the colleges and universities of Illinois, and that is that people are working side by side but getting different benefits. Um, we think tier two is the reason to join SUAA. We're here to be your voice and to communicate to the policymakers just exactly what the impact is of those decisions they've made. Um, we feel uh, very, very strongly about that. And so I think the positive is to, to know that we can make change together and that if we collaborate, build consensus around these positions, we can give one strong voice to the General Assembly and to all of those policymakers um, to fix it, to become a cure for this problem that between tier one and tier two. But just know that SUAA is here to represent all college and university retirees and employees, regardless of where they are in their journey. And uh, we would look forward to em embracing and welcoming tier two folks um, every day. All right, and uh, continuing on with the vision for the association, going forward, what direction will you chart for the organization to help ensure its continued existence? How can we, we reach annuitants and solicit their support? Well, now that's a great question. It piggybacks a little bit on what we were just talking about. It does speak specifically to annuitants. And of course, a large portion of our membership is already made up of what we would call tier one retirees. And we certainly would not be where we are today without those folks and the continued support of those folks. But we do need to start to, if, if you will, get out of the choir and get out there into the congregation. And we hope by reaching out through even, um, you know, a little bit, dare we say, modern approaches like this Q&A, that we'll start to reach people through social media channels and we'll start to get outside of um, the, the traditional SUA members and start to appeal to those tier one and tier two college and university employees. We'll start getting more employees involved in this planning. Another thing that we're working on right now with the membership committee is uh, we don't know what to call it yet, but we want to appeal to future annuitants. And the way we're looking at that right now is folks who are maybe within five years of retirement. And how can we help them with that planning, with that transition and be um, a, an, an able partner in that process? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reaching the ages myself where I need to be thinking about retirement, but not too soon. I'm here for the long haul, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, but uh, those are things that we believe SUAA can partner with groups like SERS and others and really be uh, an asset to every individual who's experiencing and going through those, cha those changes. Uh, we have another member who asks, my question is, what will SUAA do to strengthen local chapters' efforts to recruit new members and retain current members? Well, we're looking to build partnerships with every chapter in the state, whether you know, you're know you quote unquote active or inactive. Um, we want to take folks who are successful in some chapters and partner them with folks who are challenged in other areas. And what we're identifying is some best practices as well as those things that lend themselves to future inactivity. Um, it seems to be very, very important that we have a great relationship with the college of the president or the universe that we're, university that we're going to. Um, and sometimes when those leadership positions change, um, SUA needs a better plan for that transition and how we work with the chapters. But ultimately this work is really being captured by uh, our member committee, which is led by Andy Small and Pat Asher. And of course, so we've also elevated Kathy Walbert to be our director of member engagement to have direct capacity, the ability to work directly with these chapters. And the member committee is discussing a lot of very innovative ideas. And this is where I wanna say, don't just send us your questions, send us your ideas as well. We are currently looking into something like a retirement appreciation day um, or what, what SUA would love to do is instead of sending you a birthday card, we'd love to congratulate every year on your retirement anniversary um, or count down for you when that potential target date might be. We want to celebrate those victories with you and we want to try and expand that membership committee with Andy and Pat's leadership to make sure that we're getting it down into that chapter level and making sure that we're helping. Um, ultimately, we can create toolkits from the, the state office, but we need to make sure that they're what you need. And, and not just something to check a box. <clears throat> so one of the questions we like to ask chapters is what are you getting from us that you don't need? And what do you need from us that you're not getting? And that of course is, is an ongoing process that we're busy with every day. 
Well, thanks, Brian. And there's another question here that was, it's a combination of questions. And um, uh, the SUAA member asks, how does slash will SUAA increase organizational transparency in areas such as board of directors activity, SUA action, and overall engagement? Thank you for asking. Uh, we've got a number of things planned to increase organizational transparency. Um, uh, first, uh, I think one of the questions had to do with SUA action. And uh, of course, we have that uh, information readily available on the Illinois State Board of Elections website. Uh, additionally, uh, we, put, we do put information on our SUA website as well. Um, that brings up an interesting thing that we're trying to work on. We definitely want to revamp and uh, revise or perhaps renovate the website. I don't know which word to use there. Um, we are currently contractually obligated till the end of the year to keep the site that we have, but we're exploring all of our options there. And as we improve that website, I think we'll be improving our communications um, as well as the platform for communications. We're having this Q&A. We hope to have a Q&A uh, with SIRS that we've mentioned before. We have got a commitment from some committee chairs in the General Assembly to come and join us for some Q&As. And of course, we'll have a platform for that information to go. But again, to, to, to make, a, make it clear, um, the Board of Directors is also very committed to providing transparent activities. Um, we are doing our best to provide a report after every board meeting. Um, and we were asked to give it to the delegates, but most recently we sent it out to all of the members. And uh, unless the board objects, I see no reason not to continue to give you those kinds of updates. And um, so we hope to have uh, an increase, if you will, in transparency across the board. Um, we, have, uh, we hide nothing because we have nothing to hide. And uh, we look forward to engaging with all of the members on these topics as we move forward. All right, and rounding out the questions related to the future and vision of SUAA, uh, what are some of your goals right now with SUAA? Well, I, I, we've got those a little bit up on the slides there. I mean, the, the short answer, I, I want to listen and learn from you what, uh, what it is that you need, but we're going to really try and listen and engage you guys to develop a a full strategic plan for the organization, something that looks ahead a year, three years, and five years down the road. Um, some of you have already started to do the math that we're not far away from another potential constitutional convention in 2028. Um, this organization has been a strong uh, leader in defending the, the uh, impairment clause of the constitutional uh, the 71 state Illinois constitution. We think that's a very important clause that needs to be protected and we need to plan accordingly for that. And, and, and I can't just make that plan up on my own, even with the experience I have. Uh, we'll need your input. You should be looking out for a member engagement survey coming to you soon. Uh, the board of directors are currently involved in a board self-assessment process and uh, we will be in touch with more information about that strategic plan. But uh, uh, in a way, just listen, learn, and and plan ahead as much as we can. Once we get that plan in place, it's uh, you've heard the old cliche, uh, plan your work and work your plan. And that's what we'll intend to do. All right. And now we're going to go ahead into the benefits and insurance questions that some of our members had. So, Brian, I'll start you out with uh, this one here, which is a, a general one, but I think on the minds of a lot of our, our folks. What is the greatest risk to the health care benefits of retirees? Lack of choice. Um, we currently have just the one plan with Aetna. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard anecdotally that that's a real challenge there and, and not just anecdotally. We know there are areas where they're just simply not accepting the, the coverage. And, um, you know, I, I know less than 1% of you asked about my personal life, but I'll, I'll share that un unfortunately my father had some illness and had to go to Mayo Clinic and he was a community college professor. Um, he went to Mayo Clinic and was able to receive the best care possible. And I've heard that Mayo Clinic is now not accepting um, Aetna Trail Advantage Plan. So we've got to work together to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. That's simply unacceptable. Uh, we will work through legislative <coughs> means. We'll put forward legislation to insist that CMS provide more choices. And we'll also work directly with Aetna um, to try and facilitate an expedited appeal process for our SUA members. We think that this is an absolutely unacceptable situation that they should have delays experiencing uh, 
anything like that is unacceptable. Um, to say that you won't accept the plan means that you don't have a plan. And that's not something that we can accept. All right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, this next question comes from uh, Joanne Morton, who is a member of ours from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. She asks, what can be done to get Delta Dental to let us pick or keep our dentists and specialists since we are paying for PPO insurance? That makes my point for me. We need more choice. Uh, if you've already got a dentist that you're working with, you need to be able to pick the plan that covers you. Um, now, dental insurance in general has obviously become over time a little bit less, uh, less and less helpful. <laughs> they cover less and less and we pay for more and more. Um, and so again, the choices are very limited there and we wanna see more choices for our, for our SUA annuitants and members. All right, and this next one, this next question comes from Andy Small, who is with NIU. Uh, Andy asks, I am, a excuse me, I am retired from Northern Illinois University and have the Aetna Advantage Trail Plan. Yesterday, I learned the local YMCA will no longer honor Silver Sneakers membership. I am told this is happening in several locations. I'm assuming Aetna has reduced the amount it pays the YMCA. If this is correct, can any pressure be put on Aetna to change its new policy? Yes. And that's because you guys belong to this organization and make it possible for us to go to them and say, what's the deal? We've already reached out to uh, representatives of the YMCAs across the state, as well as to Aetna to try and discuss this issue and learn more about it. If you um, are a member that's been impacted by this, please let us know. Um, Andy, great question. We, we want to make sure that uh, not just your situation in the area where you're coming from, is addressed, but that we prevent any of those situations from arising in other areas. Um, again, it speaks to a lack of choice. Um, if Aetna is the only plan that we have, then Aetna gets to make these decisions rather, um, it seems randomly sometimes, but I'm sure that's not the case. And, and we look forward to partnering with them on making them aware of the, in, the impact and the consequences of some of their policy choices. Um, thanks for the question, Annie. All right. Thank you, Brian. And now we're going to move on to the questions relating to the windfall elimination provision and Safe Harbor Act uh, in relation to Tier 2 pensions. Uh, Brian, uh, question is, will SUAA try and advance the elimination of the windfall elimination provision that takes away about 45 to 55 percent of a person's amount of Social Security that they would have received but instead they do not because they receive a city, state, or federal pension. That question comes from uh, SUAA member Jim Sandow. Well, Jim, this is the meat of the matter, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I've been aware of this provision, again, as the son of teachers for some time now, but um, I object to the word windfall. And, and I apologize, I'm going to take a look here at Merriam-Webster, but it's defined as an unexpected, unearned, or sudden gain or advantage. That is not what we're talking about here. This is work that people did, money that they earned. It's not unexpected. It's certainly not uh, a sudden gain or advantage. It's something that they've earned over time and invested their years of experience. And so yes, SUA will stand with you on this issue. It won't be easy. It's gonna take probably some federal action as well as state um, awareness. And we're going to need the help of everybody to make sure that the Illinois congressional delegation moves forward on this. Um, as you know, there's been some turnover in the last couple of years. We've had some key champions replaced on this issue, but we will continue to strive ahead and make sure that your issues are represented. For me, it's as simple as you should earn what you've, excuse me, you deserve what you've earned. And that's a very basic premise I think we can all get behind. All right, Brian, and this question relates to Tier 2 pensions. Uh, what are you doing about the fact that my Tier 2 SERS pension plan is worse off than Social Security, which is not intended to be a pension or retirement system? Now, again, as we just talked about the windfall, you know I don't agree 
that you don't deserve. We we think you do deserve those those earnings, and we question the whole definition of windfall. In this case, though, we're talking about the tier two plans that have been passed by the General Assembly that are in place as of January first, two thousand eleven, being such a uh, well, it's fallen short of the original objective of the original intention of the seventy one state constitution, and it's created an environment where if you earn what they tell you that you were are going to earn which as we say, we believe is less than it should be. Um, you will not make as much money as if you had been a part of social security system. So this, this question comes to us quite often. Um, and it's something that we're working on every day uh, to try and fix. So in the Senate this year, there's been no pension bills heard. They haven't really engaged on these issues, but in the house, uh, the Illinois House of Representatives, we have a champion who I believe you guys met at our annual meeting last June, Stephanie Kifowit, um, legislator from Aurora, Illinois, who was the chair of the House Personnel and Pensions Committee. There have been subject matter only hearings held through last summer and fall and again through this spring. Now, what subject matter only means is that they're not going to vote on them yet. Uh, we are right now in uh, about a week away. April 4th, 2024 is the deadline for third reading deadline. There's going to be one week where we're out of the General Assembly. But we do expect to have some substantive proposals to analyze and share with you, SUA membership, very, very shortly in the next couple of weeks. But know that we are committed to fixing this problem. We believe it needs to be fixed this spring. Um, SIRS has testified that there will be at least one individual from the Tier 2 plan who is planning to retire next year in FY25. And that will be the first time where someone will trigger this safe harbor provision, where if you make less than what you would have made under Social Security, there's a, a recourse for that. So the state of Illinois is now obligated, really, to either acknowledge that their Tier 2 plan is deficient or that the safe harbor issue and the Tier 2 plan must be fixed and address this issue. We will be working with legislators throughout this spring to address that. But what I also want to do is to bring you in for the next Q&A and some of the comments. Plan on asking, and in fact, Stephanie Kifowit has already agreed to join us for a similar Q&A session like we've just had here today. Uh, we really appreciate your patience. This is a maiden voyage for us. We are learning as we go here, and we hope to have some of these things worked out in advance of Stephanie Kifowit joining us. You will hear from us. We will ask you again, just like we did for, for this session, what are your questions for the chair of the House Personnel and Pensions Committee? And I, we think that's a really neat thing for SUA members to be able to have that direct access. And we look forward to your questions. Um, you know, additionally, we'll have better ask SIRS. We've talked about that a little bit already tonight. And then what do you want to hear about? What is there that we should be having a session on that we maybe haven't done yet? And so ultimately today I end with a question, even though I've spent all day answering yours and I hope to your satisfaction. If we need to have another of one of these for, for myself, we'll be happy to do that. But I leave you with a question of my own. What is it that you need from us that you're not getting? And what is it that you're getting from us that you don't need? What should our next session be about? And who should we invite to join us the next time around? So thank you very much to all of you who have tuned in and who participated in asking the questions. And we look forward to our next session very, very soon.